the Rider TV studios yesterday. And oh my goodness, I'm glad that's finished. <laughs> that was pretty tough going, that's for sure. Yeah, so uh, coming up, as I said, we're going to have the speed stick update video this week and also the what's it like sailing in all conditions video coming up on Joyrider TV this week. Uh, we've got Chris on board as well. He's on the towboat in New Orleans this morning. Nice. Wow, that must be pretty cool. It's amazing how everybody's worlds are so different um, and quite difficult to imagine. Yeah, we're going to be um, uh, talking about some of Chris's uh, Dyneema rigging information later on. So if you're into a bit of Dyneema rigging, do stay tuned because we're going to be talking about that indeed. So um, I think I'll start off with some preloaded questions, um, if I may. So we're going to start off with a question from Albert, who says, I do not understand the pitching force transposed into healing force. OK, so what uh, Albert's talking about here is in quite a lot of my videos where I'm referring to sailing as fast as possible. Um, what I talk about quite a lot is, here we go, got the pen, got the whiteboard. So wind, of course, coming from the top, standard, is whenever we're embarking on one of these big speed runs, we start off on a beam reach because the beam reach with two sails is a um, the most powered up point of sail because the wind is hitting the boat square on. So it's very powerful and it's a good point to start our speed runs from. And then every time this hull, the windward hull, lifts out of the water, that hull lifting is basically energy which can be converted into more speed. If that hull is out of the water and we can keep it out of the water, then what we can do to convert that energy into more speed is turn further away from the wind. Just checking we're still on there. Um, so if this hull comes out of the water, we can turn further away from the wind. And as long as we can still keep the hull lifted on this new angle, then that new angle, we're going to be able to fa sail faster than on this angle. And this keeps going like in a um, continuous fashion. If on that new angle, smaller boats required, I think, um, if on that angle, we can still lift the windward hull, We'll turn deeper. And if we can still lift the windward hull, we'll turn deeper. And basically, this is for two sails or one sail, just not spinnaker sailing so much. Although the some of this is the same for sailing with a spinnaker. But um, yeah, so if we can keep the windward hull out of the water, we can achieve higher speeds by sailing further away from the wind. Um, so if at any point the wind, you can't, you don't have the power to keep the windward hull out of the water, then we might just need to nudge back slightly towards the wind, uh, which is going to power the boat up a little bit more if it's not quite windy enough for that. One thing that is important though, if you are sailing on any of these points of sail, windward hull comes up. You can't just turn downwind. If you try just turning through that angle to get more boat speed without easing the sheet, the main sheet specifically, you're likely to stick the nose in and flip the boat over. So if you are ever turning for more speed to go, or at any time, if you're in double trapezing conditions, if you're looking to be turning more downwind, you do need to ease main sheet as you turn the corner. And then once you've turned the corner, that you can then bring 
the main sheet back in, um, but just keeping an eye on your kind of pitch rate, your um, the angle of the boat. So if when you pull the main sheet in, the bow goes down, perhaps don't pull it in anymore. Or if you're not already right at the back of the boat, you should be moving towards the back of the boat there. Um, but that is what I'm talking about when talking about transferring healing force into more speed by taking the boat off the wind more. Uh, this is, of course, if we're doing a speed run, if we are more likely, if we're sailing a course and sailing upwind, then, of course, we don't want to do this because we're never going to end up. Um, we're never going to end up at the windward mark or where it is that we're wanting to go. So this is just if we are we've got the GPS on and we go, right, let's see how fast we can go. This is the way there. OK, hello to everybody who's tuning in. Um, all right, Martin, good to finally see you today. Yeah, so yeah sorry about these um, a bit of technical problems. Um, it seems to be every time I try to make things better, I end up actually breaking it with the live stream videos. Um, yeah, so um, I had to really scratch my head and have a look, uh, do a Google search to find out what was going on there. So apologies uh, for the late start. OK, Chris says, I'll try to answer in the chat if that's OK. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, yeah. Um, all right. So we've also got Mike on board. Hello, Joe. Just picked up a 1978 Hobie 16 and he's named her Death Cheater. Strong name. Sounds pretty fast. Yeah, nice. That's great. Um, we'll have to see that, of course, on Show Us Your Cat coming up. Oh, there's one I didn't mention as well. The Show Us Your Cat this week is going to be the, the long-awaited Tornado Special from the World Championships this year. At the World Championships, I took a wander around the boatyard. I talked to a lot of the competitors about their boats and perhaps the history of their boats, what modification they've made. Uh, got, I tried to make it so that they were quite different to each other, the boats, because a lot of the boats, of course, in a lot of classes are very similar. So uh, we'll be taking a look at some tornadoes next Sunday. Very exciting there. All right. So... Um, Eggy, thanks for all your videos. Priceless material, yeah, I think so too. Um, I tried a Hobie Wave this summer and loved it. Nice. Now planning to get a Hobie 16, so I have some questions. All right. Firstly, yes, it's a great idea. Uh, well done. Good choice. Um, question one. Any European online shops for spare parts? There's two which I would say are the go-to um, ones, of, as far as I'm aware. Um, both of them are um, in Holland, in fact. One is, um, I think it's called catparts.nl. This is actually the, the same company as Hobie Cat in Holland, run by a guy called Johan. Very nice guy indeed. And he knows a lot about Hobie Cats and how to um, repair them, what parts they're likely to need. He'll know exactly what you need for your boat. And I believe that web website is called catparts.nl. There we go. The other one, um, which has a bit more of a wider range across all the different brands of catamaran, is called BNR. I, I can't remember, to be honest, if it is um, uh, dot .com or I think it might be BNR Water Sports. But if you put in a, a Google search for BNR Cat Sailing Holland, then you'll find them. Those are the, um, those are the ones which 
uh, I know about and I have used in the past. So uh, check those guys out. Yeah, but good luck with that, Eggy. Um, I wish you has a lot of luck and uh, yeah, nice choice. All right, um, we've got Stefan on board, feeds ra feeding ravens. Um, I love the smell of adrenaline when turning down wind in the gust. Yeah, if you get the, if you get your apparent wind right, you can turn downwind without that smell. So that is quite important as well. So I'm just trying to work out uh, what I, I think I'm missing with Mike's boat name, Death Cheater. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm yeah, I'm not getting that one. Chris has got it, but I haven't. I haven't quite got that one there. So um, while I'm uh, confused about that, going to go on to this uh, preloaded question, which is the one which um, I've got some input from Chris on that, and this is from Luca, who I believe is in Italy. Who says, have you talked about the viability of making Dyneema rigging? Uh, I have to replace a diamond wire on my rig. And down here, it's very difficult to find the press and the connectors. And he's tempted to give it a try. So uh, first, the first one is, yes, it has been done. And Chris, who is on board at the moment, is a master in this department. Chris is involved with uh, Coligo Marine, which is in Texas, and they are making full, uh, full uh, Dyneema rigging for the boats. Personally, my only experience is with the trapeze wires, but um, I'm going to just read what Chris has told told me about this, so I did get in touch with Chris to ask. And he said the following, for Dyneema sizing, we don't typically size the line on diameter, but on the load of the line reaching around 20% of the maximum braking strength. This allows us to see virtually zero stretch. Um, for fittings, we want to use specialised fittings such as Coligos, which are made to adapt our beach cuts, cats or to mast tangs. Or we use closed thimbles such as the Ronstan Sailmakers thimbles. These prevent chaffing by reducing sharp edges. And Chris says he typically goes one size up when building with these. And then uh, continuing, he says, for splicing, a straight berry works. However, it must be stitched for security and a properly, a properly length berry at a minimum of 21 fid lengths, or that is roughly 57 times the diameter of the line, which goes inside itself. Um, a more secure method is to weave the line and perform a long berry. However, it still must be stitched. And the best method is to use a locking Brummel splice, uh, which actually is a splice that I learned after getting quite a lot of feedback about how bad my splicing was. But um, there it is. I'm just going to. Here's a link to Chris's um, video page um, on his YouTube channel. If that's all right to put that there, Chris. Um, in fact, I'll press return and I think it goes out. Three fit lengths, okay. Um, yeah, or tw I think it was 57 times the diameter of the line inside. And Chris says on the topic, Coligo Marine has done it on their Hobie 18. You and he says you have to prepare the spreaders uh, to put some anti-chaffing gear on there and your diamonds will be around. It will be about four mil, the actual diameter of the rope. So there we go. That's some pretty involved um, 
that's quite a response, I think. Thanks very much to Chris for all the info on that. Um, but it is, if you're not used to it, like me, like your standing rigging made out of Dyneema. When I saw my first Dyneema trapeze wires, I thought, what the heck is going on here? But I think as time marches on, it is going to become more common to see rope rigging on boats. What the big advantage, of course, of the rope rigging is that you can make it yourself. All you need to do is get um, the right tools, the fids that you need and the splicing tools, and then you can make it yourself without needing to get um, a, some sort of uh, boat rigger to do it for you. Of course, you do need to do a very good job and you need very good tools. If you check out uh, Malcheski Composites, they are doing a splicing kit, which is very nice, a fid kit, and um, well worth a look there. But yes, it is. Um, the new, it could become the new standard way of having the boat rigged. Uh, Chris continues. I'm just gonna just gonna read this one. The best rope will be heat set or it will stretch for months to get the constructural stretch out. Uh, Chris is, is going on four years, no stretch and no issues. Yeah, so I just replaced all of the rigging on all of our catamarans. I think it was four years ago. You probably know better than I do on that. And I'm just going to replace it all again next year um, because we did have a couple of masts come down this summer which for me is the alarm bells going off of time to replace. And when you've got about 30 catamarans, that's a lot of rigging. Yeah, so um, to do it all with Dyneema would be quite a task, but it would be quite exciting to uh, make that step. But we are going to stick to wire. OK, and Chris says the Ronstan Selma fids are the ticket, uh, which in this context means very good indeed okay so who else is tuning in ah ha ha cheat death yes yeah i got yeah i got that yeah okay all right thanks mike and hello scott tuning in um yeah great to have you on board and we got roger what's up in kansas city there yeah. yeah thanks for tuning in and um Oh, we got Frank there as well in uh, Canada. Nice to have you on board, Frank. It's been a while. Um, yeah, so this uh, Q&A on a Sunday is just for this week. Then next week, we will be back on to the Friday. And, um, and then we'll be having Show Us Your Cat, the Tornado special on Sunday. Very lively indeed. Uh, so I'm just going to move on to my next preloaded question. And this one, uh -huh, this one is coming from Kurosh in Dubai. And Kurosh is very good at uh, coming out with some very good uh, questions on the Q&A. And uh, Kurosh says, I recently went through getting a new sail made for my boat. And the sail maker was asking about my mast flexibility and my mast bend to match my luft curve, my luft curve and the mast curve. How would I go about measuring the correct mast bend, which would be suitable for a sailmaker to use as a number to make the luft curve? All right, this might sound quite technical. Uh, that's probably because it sounds quite technical. So, I have had quite an in-depth conversation with Thanos from OS3 Sales here in Vasiliki, and um, he gave me quite a good rundown on what um, you need to do. So the first, so uh, and I'll just I'm just going to simplify this question for anybody who's um, finding this a bit of a head scratcher. Basically, Kurosh is looking to get a new mainsail made. Um, but with the more technical boats like the A-Class, the Tornado, um, some F-18s, 
uh, definitely most boats with a carbon mast. If you're not going to buy, if you are getting a uh, a sail custom made and you want it to be the fastest sail, the most efficient it can be for your boat, um, then getting a measurement of the luft cur- luft curve of your mast is a very important part of that process. So the first thing that you need to do is to set your mast bend to a medium, what you'd have it set up for in a medium wind, which we did talk about this last week, which would be, so when we talk about uh, mast bend, on boats such as the ones that I just listed, like the A-Class, the Tornado, F-18, and what have you, you've got the ability to pre-bend the mast about, uh, I don't know what, about a third of the way up the mast, maybe a bit more. We've got the spreaders, and then just below the rest of the rigging, we've got what's called the diamond wires. And then, so to set your mast up for a medium amount of wind, as we know, as we know if we tuned in last week, the spreaders, we can alter this. I'm going to do this same picture that I did. um, Because it's good to paint the whole picture, I think. So this is the mast. These are the spreaders, which would usually be in some sort of form of two bars or a big bar and a little bar at the back. Now, the further we put the spreaders back, so this is the front of the mast, the further we put the spreaders back, the more the diamond wires are going to push that part of the mast forwards, which is going to give us more pre-bend. Um, so who wants more pre-bend? Lighter teams need more pre-bend because what the pre-bend does the more you have, the more easy it is to flatten the sail and take the power out of the sail for the lighter teams. The heavier teams need a straighter, stiffer mast so that they can get more power out of the sail, uh, which means if we want it straighter and stiffer, we'll move the spreaders further forwards so they become more in line with the mast. And if you want to have less power, so if you're lighter, this isn't quite an exaggeration, we put the spreaders further back, sorry, um, so that will really push the mast forwards. That will bend the mast more with less tension. So for a medium wind strength, we're firstly going to set the spreaders to our um, average crew weight. So um, the way that we will set the spreaders, of course, making them both exactly the same amount of rake, the amount that they come back, is um, we're going to then take a straight line such as a baton between the tips of the spreaders. We're then going to measure between the back edge of the mast and that straight edge and that is what's called our spreader rake or spreader deflection. So that is the first thing we need to do, is to make sure the spreaders have got the right amount of spreader deflection for your normal team weight. All right, so I think uh, I'm just going back to memory here, but uh, on a Hobie Tiger, for example, this distance for a medium weight team medium weight team being 150 kilos around that kind of arena, this measurement is going to be five and a half centimetres. So this is quite extreme, the drawing, but you get the idea, I'm sure. And then before before you're going to measure, um, do any measurements for your sail, we're still setting the mast up. We then need to put the tension in the diamond wires. So the spreader deflection is relative to your crew weight. 
then the diamond wires are relative to the wind strength. So um, this is for all team weights, then the diamond wire tension. So in the lighter wind, the lighter wind, we don't want the mast to be as bent, so we don't put as much tension in the diamond wires. So on a Hobie Tiger, don't quote me on this because I haven't checked it for a little while. I'm just using the memory to remember. Um, in light winds on the diamond wires, we'd be looking at, I think it's 36. Um, and that number is on the loose gauge rig tension meter. Like I said last week, if you don't have a loose gauge rig tension meter, see if you can um, borrow one off somebody else. Get your, your different tensions, put a mark on the mast at a convenient point to say where it is at 36. And then medium wind would be about 38, heavy wind about 40 on the loose gauge um, and then just put some marks on the mast so you know how much to tighten the diamond wires for those different wind strengths. So for measuring the sail, we're going to do it at a medium setting. So we've set our spreaders and we're going to put it in the middle there. Um, and then that's the mast set. So that is the mast bend that you're looking for, which we're trying to get the information of that to the sail maker. OK, we're doing well. Next thing you need to do for the measurement is raise your mainsail, your existing mainsail. There we go. And um, in fact, I'm just going to take the diamond wire off there. It's still on but for the, a bit of a clearer picture of what we're up to. All right, so with the main sail up, we then want to just pull, uh, pull the main sheet in as much as you can with one arm. That's a good way to gauge it because you don't want to crank it in, but you want to have it tight. So pull it in as much as you can with one arm. And then once you've got the main sheet pulled in, just pull the downhaul on until you're getting rid of most of the creases in the sail. So the sail looks smooth. All right. So then that is the sail in the correct position there. Just drawing in a bit more mass there. And then what we're going to want to do, if you haven't got to this stage already, is we want to put the boat on its side because otherwise it's going to be very difficult to take these measurements. Um, so put the boat onto its side and then we're going to take a line, a piece of rope uh, from the back edge of the mast and some boats, some classes like the Tornado, for example, does have a black band at the mast which says that is where the top of the sail should be. And it would also have a band at the bottom of the mast. But um, what you want to do is take it from where the top of the sail is. If you haven't got these bands, this line, in fact, the line is going to be a different color. And you want to pull it tight. This is an exaggeration, of course. Um, and that will go onto the top of the boom. Yes, so touching the back of the mast on the top of the boom. Right, just going back to my notes from Thanos. Um, where are we? All right, measuring for the Lufka. Take a straight line from the top of the mast, black band, black band if you've got one, and to the gooseneck, pull it tight. All right, and then, all right, the next, so the first measurement that you're going to take is you're going to take your, your measuring stick, find out where this line is furthest away from the mast, which you'd think would be around where the spreaders are. And you're going to take a measurement from the back of the mast 
to the line. So that's going to be your first measurement there. And I'm just checking this, checking the notes. Yep, yep. Yeah. And then for a general measurement, depends how many measurements your sailmaker wants. Ha, ah, Kurosh is just here. Oh, yeah, we're talking about your, your measurements here. Um, there's two ways of doing it. And the first one is you then um, measure to find out what's halfway between that point and the top of the mast. And, if, and then we take a second measurement there from the back of the mast to the straight line. And of course, we're going to want to know the distance from the top of the, from the black band at the top to where these measurements were taken. Um, so let's say the mast is nine meters. So these figures are not gonna be correct, but let's say that is, um, and then halfway there is gonna be, um uh something like 725 or something and then we're going to take a third measurement halfway between there and the bottom of the line which is on the top of the gooseneck like there so that would be let's just say 225 the distance from there to there 225 and then the distance there so those are the distances that the measurements that we want to get for greater accuracy. Now, here we go. Here is some greater accuracy. Hope everybody's enjoying this. I certainly am. Good to get into a bit of detail. Um, of course, on our sale, we have got some natural measuring points, uh, which happen to be the battens. You're not going to believe, I bet, I dare say some of you have already guessed what's coming up here. Um, so the other um, way that we can measure it, we're still going to be measuring from the back of the mast to the straight line, but we can measure it at each batten. Um, so that will also tell the sailmaker where the battens were on your original sail. And I'm told, um, that when measuring, if that's the batten pocket, measurement should be in the middle of the batten pocket. So take a measurement at the first batten and so on. So we're getting many more measurements this way. There we go. So, and, but we're also, as well as taking these measurements of um the bend at the different battens we're going to be taking the distances of how far those battens are from the top of the mast or the bottom of the mast but i think it's important to say whether you're going up or down just to make sure that's perfectly clear so there we go that would be how to measure the um the pre-bend in the mast to give that data to the sailmaker. There we go. Thanks to Kurosh for that very interesting question. I liked it very much. And in fact, at this point, we're gonna take a short commercial break for everybody who's watching later. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, talking of commercial break, if you haven't been over for a while, at totaljoyrider.com. We've got a brand new range just in, especially for Christmas, or if you want to buy someone a present. Yeah, um, it's listed under gifts. Lots of very nice things there, including socks, um, yeah, which is very good. I would certainly suggest if you are wanting to get anything in time for Christmas, get your order in by the end of November, just to really um have that peace of mind that you have done it in time everything that's on the website is totally customizable so if you want to get something like this but you don't want it to say joyrider you want it to say your boat name uh so if you want it to say death cheater um with the sale number on there 
um, as well. And perhaps you've come up with a slogan of your own. Um, Pull it till it feels good. I think it's a nice one. Um, then just send for anything custom. Very important. Send me an email. Don't order anything. Send me an email. If you order something and then email me, um, then it gets a little bit confusing. So send me an email, custom designs, whatever colours you want as well. If you want your sale colours on there, lovely. Uh, get involved, get stuck in. There we go. That was the commercial break. All right. Um, so just scrolling back in the live chat. Uh, so the, the final word on the Dyna Dyneema rigging here is that Chris says that Dyneema will last two to three times longer than the steel and it's a lot easier to make. So there we go. I think it's certainly there's a lot of ticks in the box for getting the Dyneema rigging. And um, yeah, why not? I think one thing is, though, what. What I would do definitely is if, which you should do either way, is if you're leaving your boat for the winter, don't leave the rigging exposed. Um, if you can take the rigging off the boat, whether it's wire or Dyneema, take it off the boat so it's not exposed to the elements for the whole year. Because uh, it's being exposed to the elements, that's what degrades things. So well worth taking it off there. All right, Eggie says uh, he's just bookmarked those stores. Uh, that would be uh, catparts.nl and BNR Water Sports. Question two, here we go. So uh, if you missed this earlier, Eggie's just getting a Hobie 16 first boat. He says, is it safe for three adults plus maybe a child on board in no strong wind and 10 to 12 knots? And what's the ideal positioning for three to four people on a 16? Um, and I've seen that Chris says there, it's perfectly safe. He's had his Prindle, he's had his kids on the Prindle since um, an early age. But yes, it is safe as long as, I think it is fairly important that the children can swim. Or if they can't swim, they should be wearing a, um, it's, uh, they should learn to swim, of course but um, wear a life jacket with a collar. So because with one of these life jackets with a collar, they can just lie in the water and treat it a bit like it's an armchair. And if you are sailing with kids for the first time, even if the wind's not very strong, I think it's nice to make sure that they're going to be confident in the water in the event of either a capsize or falling overboard. Because what you don't want is anybody panicking or having a rubbish time because they're a bit scared. So make sure that everybody is comfortable in the water as well. Um, that goes for everybody who's going out. Maybe you're taking some friends out, but it is something that does get missed. Uh, we miss it quite frequently down here. If someone just turns up on the beach, says, can I go out for a sail? The words, can you swim, should, you know, it's, it's quite a funny one because on the one hand, it's quite obvious that you might need to. But by asking that question, it kind of lets them know that they are going to get wet at some point. So um, confidence in the water, I would say, is important. And get them used to, if you are using a life jacket, um, get them used to being able to float in the life jacket or with a buoyancy aid, how that affects their flotation and ability to manoeuvre in the water. So that would be uh, the first things of taking others out on a boat, whether it's kids or anyone else. Then uh, the other thing is um, just before taking out um you know other people non-sailors let's say just try to have fairly standard your capsize writing routine and also your man overboard routine so 
you know what to do if somebody falls off. You know what to do if you capsize. First thing, if you capsize, should be a quick personnel check because even in 10 knots of wind, it is possible to capsize if you take your eye off the ball uh, a little bit. So it is worth making sure you're ready for all of these eventualities. So, um, but other than that, I'd say just go for it. Of course, with kids especially, make sure they're not going to get cold. Everybody has a rubbish time if they start getting cold. Even if it's a fairly uh, fairly hot day, consider the temperature of the water as well. Uh, so if anybody does end up in the water or if there's a bit of spray, windage. So I'm sort of talking more for comfort and confidence. That would be the main uh, factors that I would talk about uh, when thinking about taking kids out for sale, especially if it's the first time. And then the positioning, all right. Where would you sit? Depends on the wind a little bit. If it's, let's draw the people in green because we can. Um, so just for recreational sailing, if the wind is, is very light and there's definitely no chance of lifting the hull, I would say the helmsman, person steering the boat, around here we're looking at recreational this is not for top top boat speed uh crew number one there so once again this would be wind from the top so the sails would be like here and then the third team member around here somewhere and then if you are sailing with four people maybe one somewhere lounging on the trampoline um, or over here as well. Um, but you want to, with a 16 especially, not be taking more than about 200 kilos on the boat because it is going to get very sluggish with a lot of weight on there. With a, a bigger boat, like, um, like Chris's Prindle 19, you could take 200 kilos easy because it's a very voluminous boat but on a Hobie 16 uh, that should be what you consider to be your maximum amount of weight on there. If the wind gets up so much that it's possible to lift the hull I don't think anyone would want to be sunbathing on the trampoline then and what I would do is probably three people would be the right and the maximum amount and just have everybody on the windward side like lined up on the side uh, it's going to be much more comfortable and then you might just need to give people instructions move forwards move back those sort of things uh, that's uh, so if you're going upwind you want everybody sort of slightly further forwards if you're reaching sailing across the wind you want to get everybody slightly further back just because even in 10 to 12 knots of wind, the bows will start to dip very slightly um, there. So there you go, Eggie. I hope that helps. All right. Yeah, don't forget a date for your diary next year. Chris has just uh, reminded me. Start of June next year, the Prindle North Americans. If you sail a Prindle, you need to be getting to Texas the start of June because this is going to be fantastic. It's celebrating 50 years of Prindle racing in the USA. Uh, I'm going to try to get to this myself as well. Um, Chris is one of the masterminds behind this event going on. So if you do sail a Prindle, get to the event. If you don't sail a Prindle, but you've been thinking of getting one, now's the time. Get it get the boat all polished up over the winter, then hit the water as early in the season as you can, and then get down to Texas in June. Lovely. All right, there we go. All right, Frank with a navigational question. If you were a cat sailing to a specific destination, i.e. an island or a beach, um, 
what instrument can you use to help you navigate and stay on course, especially in fog? I would say um, with the way things are these days, if I was going to go on a on any sort of sailing expedition where there was a chance of not being able to see where I wanted to go, I would think taking a telephone in a dry bag has got to be uh, has got to be the choice these days. You could get a um, uh, some sort of compass that you can put on your boat as a backup as well but i would say the telephone just with if you've got uh i think just on google maps it will tell you where you are and i think that's a good choice so i think that's what i do uh frank if i was in that situation get a dry bag or a or a clear um telephone case in fact uh what i'm using here is is called a hit case I bought this myself. They're not giving me stuff. But this one is um, is totally waterproof and it's got on it a lanyard, um, which I thought was a very good idea. But if I'm taking this on the boat, I'll put this in a dry bag as well, just due to telephone paranoia. But um, there you go. The hit case, I think, is the main competitor for the life proof case which is the other very popular dry case for telephone. Chad says, interesting, glad that things are interesting here. Um, all right. Oh, there we go. Chris is going to um, help Frank out there. Yeah, Chris, he knows a lot about being on the sea, so uh, he can really help there. Green people are seasick people. Ha uh ha. -huh. That's another point. Check out for the seasickness when taking out non-sailors. Um, all right. So on to the next preloaded question. And I think if we can say no further questions now, because we're almost up to an hour that we've actually been going on, um, that would be great. And I have got a bit more in the preloaded department. All right. So this one is from Anthony. And he asks, I don't know what to do with the boom on my Dart 18. It's basically a rope and it's apparently loosened when I attach to the uh, mainsail outhaul. Seen videos of other cat sailors showing that the sheet was tensioned whilst some other left that loose and rotating by pulling it into the middle. OK, so um, this is a Dart 18 spanner line question. So one of the unique design points of the Dart 18 catamaran. It's going to be a perfect. That's not bad. Looks like a Dart 18 sail. Bit long. Is we've got on the mast. We've got, uh, like on many boats, we've got a bar that comes off the mast. So there's the front of the mast. There's a bar that comes off the back of the mast. And that is called a spanner bar because it acts very much in the same way as a spanner that you'd use to tighten your nuts. Um, and then on the Dart 18, what we have, um, it doesn't have a boom. Instead, what we have is a spanner line. So the idea of the spanner line is it stops the mast from rotating too much. So this line will go from the spanner bar to the clue of the sail like that. So it means that the Dart 18 doesn't have a boom, which makes uh, your head a bit safer from get, getting hit by the boom. Um, so there's the spanner line there, which um, prevents the mast from rotating any further. So what um, most Dart 18 sailors would do is 
the spanner line would usually be double like a big loop and then onto a small carabiner which when you're rigging the boat would just clip on to to the uh the spat the end of the spanner bar so then we'd have that line going like that and then there's the clue of the sail there where that line is perm permanently through there um and i did uh research this question a little bit and the dart 18 class is one of these classes which is quite strict on if you're going to be competing anyway uh quite strict on what lengths of lines and everything you're using on the boat and in the dart 18 class it says that line should be three more three meters 47 uh but with a tolerance of 50 centimeters so it could be three 47 plus or minus 50. So that would mean anywhere between, basically between three meters and four meters, pretty much. Um, and what a looser spanner line will do is that will mean the sail will naturally, the mast will naturally be opening more. So if we're sailing along, um, it's going to be opening more, which is going to be better perhaps for lighter winds. And then if that line is shorter, the mast is going to be pulled in a bit more, which is going to make it naturally a bit better for heavier conditions. But that is the length of the line which you must use. And then um, they're saying it has to be a five mil rope. And not specific about the rope, so you could use absolutely anything you like on there. Uh, what a lot of people, when I used to sail a Dart 18, which was quite some time ago now, uh, what a lot of people used to do was on the downwind leg, um, if we draw in the boat, something like this, um, hulls like that, that's how it looks, the crew would be sat on the leeward side on the downwind leg and and he'd be have one hand on the uh spanner line so he's pulling it and leaning against it a little bit which is going to pull the mast out more and it's also going to pull the clue of the sail in more putting more curve into the bottom of the sail but to be honest i think the trends have probably changed since then in the dart 18 class but that is what i've got on this dart 18 uh topic all right who else do we have on board we've got simon who asks what treatment do you do on your holes during the winter break cleaning gel coat what else yeah so um in fact that's very interesting because this year we uh, um, have sent some of our boats away to be re-gel coated. What? This is uh, very exciting. So we've sent away at the moment two Tigers and one Pacific, uh, basically to be taken all the way down, totally rubbed down, totally repaired, all the little holes and everything, uh, previous repairs um, tidied up perhaps. And um, then re-gel coated. So we should be getting these three boats back looking like they're brand new. Watch this space. Yeah, in um, March or April when I'm putting the boats together, we will see the results of that. Uh, we've sent them across the other side of Greece to be done. And the price that we're paying for that work is uh, 600 euros per hull on these uh 18 foot hulls which compared to the price of replacing the boat especially with the tiger or the pacific you can only get them uh built to order so they'd be quite expensive uh it seems like a very good idea for us so when um we've seen the results of that work that we're having done then we'll decide 
if we're going to send the rest of the boats to be done as well. But um, what we generally do uh, to clean the boats at the end of the season is we're using um, a cleaning liquid. I've done two videos on this, I think, you, which has got the active ingredients, muratic or muracic acid, which eats any of the brown stuff that basically accumulates on the hull over time. And then after that, uh, just a light polishing using a cutting uh, compound, which just takes out any of the very small scratches uh, just to finish that job there. So that's what we're into. OK, and what we're into now, we've been going for an hour. So we're into some any further questions. We'll be getting quick answers because we are up to an hour now. Um, there we go. And in fact, I'm just going to answer my last preloaded question before I come on to these final questions for today. And this one is from Anze, who lives in Ljubljana which, of course, is the capital of Slovenia, as we all know. Um, he says, I own a 2004 Topcat KT. And he's wondering if he should upgrade it with a rolling Jenica. Is there much difference in performance or fun in sailing? OK, here we go. This is a great question. Should I put? a spinnaker, whether it's a rolling one or one that goes in a chute, one that goes on the bag. Um, it's the same story for everything because the way that the spinnaker is stored is basically down. It comes down to convenience, um, which way you're going to store it and what you prefer. But um, does it make the sailing experience more fun? I would say it really depends on how much wind you are going to be sailing in the most often. If you're normally sailing in light to moderate winds, so let's say never really in winds above 15 knots, let's say, then yes, adding a spinnaker to your boat is really going to add a lot of sizzle, especially on the downwind legs, because most catamarans that don't have a spinnaker, if you are on a long downwind leg in light winds, it can be a little bit. Um, it's a good time for a chat, I think, or if you're on your own, a good time to reflect and think about things. Whereas if you have um, got a spinnaker, even in light winds, it really makes it so much more interesting. Of course, the boat's going to go much quicker as well. So, yes, if you're sailing mostly in light winds, add in the spinnaker, a lot more fun. Second one is, do you like doing a lot of long distance sailing? If you like long distance sailing, it really is going to give you a lot more range of where you can go if you've got a spinnaker. Because, again, on the downwind leg, you're going to be sailing much faster, which means uh, you've got more range. You can go further. So, yes, the time when I wouldn't say um, that the spinnaker is going to add more fun is if you mostly sail in stronger winds uh, above 15 knots, when the boat should be providing you with a lot of excitement without the need for putting up a third sail. That is what I would say. So, for example, uh, in a real world example, uh, wild wind Vasiliki here, we don't put spinnakers on our 16s because uh, we're sailing pretty much every day in strong winds and um, we don't want to have all that extra gear on the boat, which is going to give us more windage. There's more things to break, more things that you can hit if you find yourself um, stumbling on the boat, like during a pitch pole or something. Um, Yes, yeah, so uh, because we're sailing in strong winds a lot, whereas a wild wind in Mauritius, one of their main things that they do there is sailaways. Uh, so they go on long distance sails most most days of the week. So uh, 
having a spinnaker on the boat, again, it's this range thing, means they can sail a lot further, and that is nice. So there we go. That is what I think about should you fit spinnaker to a boat that hasn't got a spinnaker. Okay, we're just getting towards the end now. So uh, no more questions if you could, unless you've got something that's absolutely burning. And uh, it's because I started late, which is um, why you haven't managed to say hello yet. Hello to Robin in Florida. Great to have you on board. Hope everything's all right over there. Of course, um, one big bit of news, I believe, the F-18 World Championships going to be in Florida in October uh, next year. And it's just been announced that the European Championships for the F-18 is going to be at Lake Garda, Italy in Arco. And um, to be honest, I'm pretty keen. Um, I've been talking to a new uh, possible crew for that, a bit lighter than Swedish which should give us that little bit of zip uh, on the boat. And, and Lake Garda, of course, which, um, as you may have seen in previous videos, is a lot windier than Thessaloniki. I think most days getting about 18 knots of wind, which is really quality boat racing conditions. OK, so continuing. Thanks for tuning in, by the way. Don't forget to give this a like while you're still here, before you leave. Uh, that does help for other people getting to see this later on. It will pop up, more likely to pop up in their um, feed if uh, it's got more likes. Oh, thanks, whoever that was. Yeah, straight in. All right, so we've got Scott. What is the optimum crew weight on a 16 for speed? What was your... What was your crew weight in the speed video this summer? with that little girl a few episodes before Joe dropped his sandwich overboard. OK, yeah, um, it's been pretty widespread. In fact, seeing as you guys are here, um, I've got a little treat for you. Uh, I was going to sort of release this in a video at some time. But what I've been doing throughout the season in Vasiliki is every time I banged in a big speed. I noted what, the, of course, what the speed was and how heavy the team was. This is pretty interesting, I think. Uh, this should get a thumbs up. Um, that's for sure. All right. So here we go. Um, what should I do? My top 10 Hobie 16 speeds and what the crew weight was on those occasions. Um, so, there's been a lot, actually. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so in 10th, was out with David. That's the time when I fell off, actually. Um, and we got 24.45, 170 kilos. Sorry, I'm going kilos and not pounds. You'll just have to put that into your um, converter. Then in ninth, uh, I sailed with Wolfgang, quite a big German chap, and we hit 24.55 knots, uh, combined weight 175. Then um, in eighth, I sailed with Kathy, who was one of our instructors from Ireland, and we hit 24.68 knots, and that was with a combined crew weight of 140 kilograms. So you're going to see that there's not really any pattern here so much. Then in seventh with James, uh, 24.75, 170 kilos. Also 170 kilos, but a bit quicker with Jan from Germany. Um, Jan from Germany with speed 24.87. Then we are notching it up now. Um, what's this? Uh, sixth, I think, was with Andreas, again from Germany. And that was a speed of 24.92 uh, and a crew weight combined of 170. And then a bit quicker still was with Max. Max from Rosenheim, Germany, in fact 
We hit 25.09 knots, combined weight 185. And then a bit quicker still from with Amy from the UK, we did 25.11, and that was with a combined weight of 155 kilos. So that shows that it's not necessarily the heavier weight that gets the biggest speed. Is everybody having fun? I'm having fun. This is good. Um, and then a bit quicker was Office Hands Dave from Lake Lanier, Georgia, USA. Uh, this is, of course, quite a heavyweight crew. Um, 25.2 knots and top speed. of uh, uh, Sorry, that was the top speed. And the crew weight, 195 kilograms. And then in second place was with Piers from the UK, 25.25 knots, top speed. Uh, uh, so that was the top speed, crew weight, 180. And then the top speed that I got this year was with Rick, also from the UK. Top speed was 25.77 with a combined crew weight of 170 kilograms. So there you go. That is quite a, um, yeah, it's definitely been my best summer, uh, my best year, in fact, for going fast. And I've been hunting down this 26 knots. And what I believe I'm getting here is consistency. I had over, I think there's over 25 um times when i did over 24 knots so definitely getting closer to the to that um 26 knots exciting times all right willis hi how you doing yeah no problem uh you have to re-watch it later yes of course all right alejandro could you go over baton tension windy versus light winds tight versus loose what they should look like feel like in all situations yes we can do that OK. So. Batten tension, what we want to do with our battens is we want to put them into the batten pockets and we want to tie them so they can't move. That is pretty much it. What it should look like is if this is our batten pocket. If we've got the sail resting flat on the floor, uh, where can I draw it over here, okay? If it looks like that, while it's resting, with the sail resting flat on the floor, you've got too much batten tension. It should be pretty much flat on the floor. We're not trying to put any extra tension into the battens. Um, if the bat, so that's if it's too much, we'll see a load of curve in the batten. If it's too loose, what we're going to see is these kind of um, vertical creases in the batten pocket, which will probably extend into the sail a bit as well. And that, and if you see you've got those vertical creases in your batten pockets, just grab the end of your batten like there and just see if it moves in and out. And if it does move in and out, that means it's too loose. So you need to just tighten it a little bit, take those creases out, and then that is the sweet spot. The one thing that we would change with the battens, of course, depending on what type of boat you're sailing, is the top two or three battens in the sail, we can change the stiffness of the battens depending on how much power you want. If you want more power, we'll put in a softer batten, which is gonna curve more when we pull on the downhaul. If it's windy, we want a flatter sail at the top, we'll put in uh, stiffer battens, which are gonna stay, stay straighter, uh, meaning that you don't have as much power in the top of the sail there. So there you go. That's all we've got on battens for today. And that's all you need on battens for today. Uh, but it is worth checking your battens regularly, of course. All right. So, Stefan says the Top Cats here in Bavaria have a lot of fun with their spinnaker, and we are right at the centre of Top Cat here. 
the producer is there. So that's another, that is a yes for the Top Cat Spinnaker. Uh, Alejandro says, I have a Hobie getaway. Should I treat the battens differently than if I had a 16? No, exactly the same. No need to be cranking, tensioning, just take the uh, tension out of them. Hello, Toot in Texas. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, we've got Mark and Janet. Glad to be on board from cold Ohio. Ooh. Now going through Hobie 16 withdrawal symptoms. Yeah, I know the feeling. Because even though it's, um, it's pretty nice here at the moment, sunny, um, I did have to put all the boats away because all the staff have left, which means that I wouldn't have been able to put them away any later. So it had to be done when I did it. So I did it. All right. All right. Willis says, I think this is in um, response to those speeds. It's going to have to gain some weight. There's two with a translation, a trans uh, conversion. 170 kilos is 300, just under 375 pounds. OK, Willis says, I guess I need to buy a bigger anchor, too. Can't put on that much weight maybe with my dive gear yes and yes so there we are i think we've uh, reached the top of this hill and uh thanks to everybody for tuning in today again sorry for the fun and games at the start i was having a right old um yeah it wasn't a good start uh, i was trying to make things better and by doing so it didn't work at all as happens sometimes uh, like I said during the commercial break, one great way of supporting Joyrider TV is to do some of your Christmas shopping at TotalJoyrider.com, um, where there is a whole new catalogue there of Christmas gift ideas, even socks, got towels, blankets, uh, a, more, a, a range of hats, woolly hats as well for the winter. Very nice. But I would suggest getting anything ordered before the end of the month, um, uh, November, that is, uh, just to make sure you don't have that stress of uh, will it turn up on time. So there we go. Uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in. I'll be back on Friday with more Q&A. And before then, I should hope you have at least one other video uh, going out. Uh, so there you go. Take it easy. Wrap up warm if you need to. Or go out and send it if you can. And uh, there's still space on the speed stick. So there we go. Well worth a visit. I'll see if I can sort out my lighting a bit better for next week as well. All right. So thanks very much. We'll see you soon.